sehr, dass ihr alle hier seid oh. zu unserer Session. Oh, how about your languages? Um, so, um, why am I here? I've been friends with Catherine for many years now. Too many. I an, have been an agile coach. Um, made a change recently. I'm now a director of sales, which we now call an evil sales guy. Uh, but I've been through uh, the agile transitions, trying to move organizations to a more agile way of working become more effective, and uh, Dutch upbringing, and I have more of an options uh, approach to, to things. Uh, yeah, so let's get started. Why navigating, ad, why navigating politics? So, as Catherine introduced um, Agile coaches, as you, who here is an Agile coach? Or has been an Agile coach? Who's a developer? Ah, most Yay. Of Yay. Who's the developer in an Agile project? Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> so, um, as you may have experienced, that if you work in an organization that's now transitioning into something Agile, uh, there's a lot of resistance. And even if you become successful, and you can ask Agile coaches who've been doing this for many years, if they revisit previous uh, organizations where they've been, it's a challenge to have that change remain in there. Although it's been very successful, there are other power structures that are uh, changing the things that you're doing. So we need to find a way uh, of dealing with it. And that's the focus of this presentation. So it's based on both our, ex uh, ex from both our perspectives, or both of our experiences. We have links in there of things that we have looked up and added our own material to it. Uh, you will see inconsistencies, you will see things that are not quite polished yet. You will even see conflicting ideas, but we'll present them and then it's up to you to decide. And our aim is that you go away with this and have an opinion about what we've, what we've said. Yes, we do clearly disagree on a few things. That'll be interesting. So the agenda. We have an introduction into politics. We look into waterfall, technology, agile, lean, uh, hierarchical structure. Then we'll do the summary, and then we'll look at how we deal with it. So we'll first summarize the part beforehand, and then how, what have we done to, to yeah, make it better while we're doing it. So we hope to show you why politics increases when you put in an Agile Lean team. So politics, I sort of, when I, when I got interested in this, because every time you do a project, you think, what's the problem here? And it's generally people. And then you think, well, if we could just remove the people, everything would be amazing. Um, and I was thinking, well, politics seems to be a problem, and it's a pattern I'm seeing in all the teams that I'm dealing with. Uh, and I thought, how long has politics been around? And so I just did a quick search and found even Aristotle was writing about it two and a half or there about a thousand years ago. So it's a problem that's quite uh, a long-term issue. For me, but not Olaf, uh, I have been looking at politics in terms of the Oxford de definition up here, activities aimed at improving someone's status or increasing power within an organisation. And the other thing that I've got down the bottom in nice gr light grey so you can hardly see it, is that we have to remember people die holding on to political positions. You just have to think about um, history uh, and current wars. So we have to, I think, as an industry, start taking this whole idea of politics quite seriously because it can... Uh, influence the outcome of an Agile Lean application. For instance, uh, this is something that really did happen to me. Uh, we had a portfolio board in uh, 2010, a, a Kanban a portfolio board, and it was getting great results for the teams. Uh, and then the executives came to us and said, can you please take it down and transfer it to a spreadsheet because it's forcing the executives to be open about their priorities and it's causing conflicts in their team at that higher level. And literally, they did do that. They took it down physically and put it into a spreadsheet and added on an extra couple of meetings per week in order to politically play and land grab. Right, because what happens if you make priorities uh, transparent, then everybody has an opinion and you can see a clearly structure of how you do your prioritization. However, if you make that very public, 
you expose all of the political play and all the possible maneuvering. Now you formalize everything on how things are decided and you remove uh, the power that certain people have over helping the organization in a particular direction. And they resist that change. So in my view, <coughs> Olev, I believe that politics is a symptom. So I come from an Eastern philosoph philosophical viewpoint. And I think it re results for, it's an activity that results from emotion like frustration, pain, or fear. Right, where I th actually think that politics is a natural part of what we do. As soon as you have an organization that is more than one person, you will have politics. You will have a, 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 way, a, a game that's being played of who decides what to do and, ha and how, much, how much they would do that. I think you mean the word interaction, myself. Fair enough, you'll have interaction. So, when you talk to people, um, they think politics is evil or a symptom, whereas it's the same group of people who are complaining about the fact that if you do an agile transition, you're not getting the influence that you want. So you actually want to play in the game, but you're ignoring or you're saying that it's not supposed to be there. So it's a reality, politics is there. So if, you, if it's there, play the game and it will help you get the results that you want. Whereas I come from the perspective that um, there is something that you can use to harmonize different people's positions, and it's called reality. So that's my view. Right. So there's some research being done on uh, power by Paul Piff, and it shows that if you play, for instance, a game of Monopoly that is unfair, so you have two players and one person get four times as much money as the other player. If you interview that person after the game, what they'll do, what they'll say is that, of course, it makes sense that they won, and it has nothing to do with the fact that they make four times as much money. It's just the way that it was supposed to be. Well, if that happens on a small scale, you can imagine what happens if you do that at a larger scale. So we think it's natural to have more power if you're in a position of power. Interesting out of that same research is that the people who are in a position of less power, so less influence, are better at reading fa facial expressions. So they're, they have more of an uh, empathic link with other people. And even people in power can actually do that if they imagine themselves of having less power. So there's some, uh, uh, um, some uh, effects that are in place that if you have power, you kind of start to care less about people or you have become less sensitive, but you can train yourself to become or stay sensitive to other people. One thing that I've noticed myself, and uh, that's from the same research, and uh, I see that, is that if you're in a position of power, your wording will change. So if you're in a collaborative stage, you'll ask things more politely. If you're in a, and that, uh, that's what I've noticed myself, I'm not paying attention to it, I'm a director of sales now, I have some direct reports, and I will use more directive language in certain cases. So this, a, on a subconscious level, they've seen that in the scoop monopoly, they, do that, uh, they see that and if they do the research in, uh, in organizations. So apparently, that whole uh, power thing makes, that changes people. I have to say, giving you some feedback here, Olev, that you have become much more arrogant since you've taken on the director of sales really? role. Yes. So we have a case study example right here. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right, technology industry. Ah, and so I came from an Aboriginal, uh, I was brought up in an Aboriginal tribe because my parents were hippies. Uh, and uh, when I came into white society, I then eventually came to technology. I discovered this whole idea of um, psychopathic behavior. And when you're in technology, apparently, this attracts psychopathic leadership. You may know of a few people yourself. Uh, and so there's a, there's a lot of jobs, like CEO, salespeople, media types, that are often found in the technology industry. And here's a book, if you want to do a little bit more reading, called Snakes in Suits, which explains this whole concept, if you're interested. Yeah, and if you want to know how to spot uh, uh, psychopathic behavior, there's a whole checklist by that author that has 12 categories, but these just f five, uh, which are people are superficially charming. Psychopaths are really, really charming. But if you go under a layer deeper, they tend to be quite rude. Uh, manipulative, lack of empathy, lack of guilt. So they will do anything to get their results, but they wanna, uh, they'll manipulate people and they 
will play nice just to, to get what they want, and they don't feel guilty afterward. The other thing to remember is that um, psychopaths only make up 3% of the population, uh, and they are also very apt at mimicking empathy, which makes you, you sometimes do get a misunderstanding of, of that. So that's been an interesting discovery for myself. Uh, but you can actually turn off compassion. A normal person can turn off compassion. Um, and whereas psychopaths can't feel compassion. And there's a wide spectrum of psychopathy. So it isn't just that you know, you're a psychopath and that's it. Sometimes people are slightly like a psychopath or not, and normal people can turn off their empathy for others. Whereas a psychopath has a physical limitation. They don't, the, the part of their brain doesn't light up at all uh, when it comes to others. So the interesting thing that I noticed when I came into this society is there's this historical legal and financial structure which encourages uh, psychopathic old-style management behaviour. And that doesn't mean the people in the company are psychopaths. It just means that the way that it's structured is psychopathic. And you can actually watch the show, uh, the documentary, The Corporation. It's available on YouTube, which where they diagnose a corporation in a court of law because it's seen as a, a, a b human being in a court of law. And they say, well, what type of person is a corporation? And of course, they come up with, it's a psychopath. So as I said, normal people can turn compassion off and think like a psychopath, but a psychopath can't go the other way around. That's going to be interesting a bit later, if you go back one. Uh, and this is sort of proven in there. There was a little study where 200 people, 203 people, were deemed as having management potential, and they were put into a group, and they were studied for a while, and it found out that they had a higher rate of psychopathic behaviour. The other thing that's interesting, which adds to this equation, because all of these pieces of information that we are giving you are going to come together at some point uh, and prove uh, how agile and lean cause difficulties with politics, that um, we have a bunch of introverts, apparently, in our industry. I am one of them, but I've learned to sort of deal with the outside world. And you can actually see, um, you can read about it in this quiet, the power of introverts in a world that can't stop talking. But we're becoming much more popular now, for example, Big Bang Theory, and there are a couple of books out there, if you want to search on it, saying the benefits of introversion and how it can actually um, give value to companies. So that's a good thing. So if you look at where Agile is coming from, Agile is here as an anti-movement towards Waterfall. Waterfall, uh, as described by Winston, who knows about Winston Royce? Okay, just a... Half minute introduction. Winston Royce is the one responsible for Waterfall. Mm. Now, he is not responsible in the normal sense. He wrote a paper in 1971 uh, describing an ideal process, which is very much like a waterfall. However, uh, the Department of Defense in the US, at that time the biggest IT employer, liked it very much, said this is the standard and how we're going to do that. On page two of that same paper, Winston Royce said, and this will never work and we've suffered from that for 40 years. Uh, he made some recommendations on how things can improve. Uh, program design comes first, document the design, do it twice, plan, control, and monitor testing involve the customer, which all sounds very agile, but we've never actually come to that page and implemented that part. You don't want to turn the page on, over, no. So, Waterfall has uh, become very successful because managers like it. You can plan it, you can control it. Um, Introverts like it as well, because you don't need to interact. You just get your document, you get your stuff done. And that's cool. So, nothing wrong with waterfall. As, as you were saying, so psychopaths don't have to collaborate. They just exert their power. And introverts can apportion blame or avoid confrontation by doing documentation or saying that's, that's somebody else's problem. So that you can see why we really took to the idea of waterfall quite quickly. But this is the biggest problem, is that our industry consists of people working with people to make tools that help people interact. And so even when we had this structure of waterfall, despite waterfall, there was a lot of interaction and it started, and even Waterfall had to make interaction work. And as we see, you know, the industry started to have an incredible amount of, of change, which is now getting to the point where we talk about continuous delivery, continuous integration, and so on and so on and so on. So 
this had the effect of obviously creating these little cultures called Ajahn Lin. Uh, yes, so in my view, because I have been, I have been brought up in an Aboriginal tribe, um, I, the word tribe when, where I grew up actually meant the equivalent of nationality. So you can't really turn up to someone and say, I'm so glad you're Australian. It's something you're born into. So for me, I've had to do a shift and understand that in this environment, the word tribe sometimes means peer group. But I wanted to point out that there are different tribes in different environments, uh, and it's just my little rant. So in my particular tribe, we were in the desert. In the, so if you look at the, uh, Australia and you put your finger right in the centre of Australia and go a little bit left, it's pretty much there that I grew up. There's a lot of space, limited resources, harsh context, and whoever was best to lead at the time did. We had a bunch of specialists, hunters, foragers, elders, and perhaps facilitators and healers, um, who would interact on a day-to-day -day basis in family groups, but generally have a peer group that they interacted with periodically, sort of like conferences, where they would get together, share skills, knowledge, do some strategic thinking. But as I said, the key thing was that if you had to survive in this harsh environment, the way you needed to do that was to have a bunch of specialists collaborating together in a family group, because you needed one of everybody in order to survive. So in my head, and someone please tell me if there is an official term for this, I sort of think of it like a rotational hierarchy. This is the family group here who collaborate to survive and lead when required. So when we're hunting, the hunter's in charge. When we're foraging, the forager's in charge. And uh, we kind of follow that person because they have the expertise. However, that particular person will use their peers when they go off and have their conferences, if you like to say, their ceremonies, in which, uh, where they can compare with and see, uh, get their value, uh, their sense of mastery from. Right, and this is not just in tribes. We see that in Western society as well. Uh, in my spare time, I'm involved with the search and rescue dog group uh, as a group leader. And what we have there is a bunch of volunteers who are trained to do search and rescue work with their dog, but they have their profession as well. We have a fireman in there, we've got a policeman in there, we've got a nurse in there, we've got structural engineers in there. Uh, and although I'm officially in charge, the only thing that I do when I'm there is make sure that whoever has the right knowledge in that particular context leads the group. So that's the same kind of rotationary leadership uh, to make sure that you're successful as a group. So when you look at Agile and Lean, that's pretty much how it operates in my view. So although I don't think of Agile and Lean as a tribe, I do think it has a tribal way of working. And so we have a bunch of specialists, a tech design facilitator, etc. They aren't competing against each other. Uh, they collaborate together and get their sense of mastery and value from their external peer group. The reason that introverts will suffer through collaborating is because with their external hierarchy or peer group, knowledge elevates their position and gains them acceptance. So they're willing to suffer through collaborating together in order to get knowledge so that they get a sense of mastery with their peer group that they measure themselves against, which is what they feel attached to separately from the actual small team that they work in. I think I said that one. So we can see here clashing structures. So we've got a static old-style corporate structure, which comes from a legacy of class systems and factories, which is in place legally and financially. So it's going to be very difficult to remove. And that seems to be overlaying this new structure of working, which is rotational. There's, it's, I should mention here that political science has done a hell of a lot of research in this area, and it is well worth going and having a look at things like holacracy, ad hocracy, uh, and heterarchy. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So here it comes. Why? Why? <laughs> Why does politics increase? Well, if you look at the traditional um, structure, you might have fortnightly meetings. So the introvert's fear is, if you put in agile lean, suddenly... Uh, they'll, they'll be, it will go from, say, one fortnightly meeting to 13, all right? 
Here we have the boss's horror. So in our traditional structure, the boss uh, you know, says something and we'll go, all go and do it. But when we put in Agile and Lean, we say, maybe we will do it. So this is, the, this is where we're headed. This is what Olive and I notice, is that you have psychopathic self-interested behavior generated, as we discussed. You have a bunch of introverts with avoidance tendencies. You add to that a hell of a lot of high pressure change from the industry itself. Then you add a very collaborative and interactive agile and lean process. And it has to be that way because we're constantly adapting to the rapid change around us. So we need to interact about it. And then you encase it and put pressure from a traditional static hierarchical power structure right over the top. And it is no wonder when we squeeze all this together that it becomes a hotbed of politics. It's not our fault. It is the context. So how do we deal with it? Well, there's already some tools available within Agile. Uh, BDD, TDD, this whole list of things help us to manage the politics available out there. But it's not enough. No. So I've noticed that we, do, we have started as an industry to develop rules, uh, things like SAFE, as ways and means of dealing with structure, so this, this, this chaotic structure. But the more structure and rules we put in place, the less innovation and the less adaptability to rapid change there is. So I have been trying to explore and find a more simplified strategy that could help us on how and when to apply these tools that it could benefit in terms of politics. So I looked at, in a rapidly changing industry which relies on innovation, I mean even Apple recently is not innovating fast enough, apparently, for all of us users. Uh, and it deals with tricky technical and people problems. So the thing that I saw, personally, that we needed help to get insight, because without insight, without realization, we cannot innovate. But we're needing it more and more often in order to innovate at the rate of demand in our industry. We also need help, obviously, dealing with people, and that's not going to go away. We see that thousands of years ago, people were having trouble with people, and hello, we're still having problems with people. So, for me, I've investigated Eastern philosophy. So I study Buddhism to find ways of eliminating suffering in the workplace. Uh, and the reason I do that is because Buddhism focuses a lot on caring about people, which sounds nice and huggy, but it's actually considering people problems. So I'll have a bit of that. And I found that was what was particularly useful was Mahasi Vipassana. Vipassana is about facilitating insight. There are models within it that help you facilitate insight. And I need that, right? So the other thing that I found was Mahasi, he lived in the last hundred years, so it's a very recent form of Buddhism. He got very sad that there were a ton of lay people out there who were trying to work in the fields and wanted to have insight and enlightenment, but were too busy. So he decided to strip away all of the ceremonies or everything he could from Buddhism and come down to the basic practices that anybody could do and give them the right to have insight. You didn't have to go off and meditate on a mountain with a bunch of, you know, uh, spirit guides. So in my head, what I kind of came up with, and Olaf's got his different viewpoints, is I will reference agile lean tools and practices, and I will pull them out in a strategy format, which I'll show you. It's just very loose. And so that I can respond contextually to any political situation that comes up. The reason being that people are all different, and the different interactions of different people means you can't come up with a structure that's too rigid. When you deal with this type of person, then you behave this way. It doesn't work. And I found that tools can have multiple effects. So a Kanban board, if any of you have done Kanban, you're displaying what is to a group of people. Now, if what is is, can I swear here? <laughs> Yeah. No, I'll be polite. P <laughs> bad. <laughs> then the people looking at it are going to feel bad. Or sometimes they may not because they realize that they're going to be changing this into something good. But uh, just visualizing a problem does not necessarily give you a great reaction. You're not going to look at something and go, 
wow, that's a load of crap. You see? And so we can't assume that just because we're using these tools that it's going to give the reaction that we expect because people react differently. So I went and had a look at approach. The way we approach when we're going to do the tool, who we're going to do, um, who, who we're going to show the tool to or utilise it and how we're going to utilise it, I think becomes key to adoption in order to ensure that it's successful. So the strategy, and if you want to know this in more detail, as I said, you can go onto YouTube and watch my uh, talk, which basically goes through these steps in much more um, detail. The strategy I have is there are one, two, three, four elements to the approach you need when you're trying to deal with politics. The first one is equanimity. You need to be able to bring clarity, openness and curiosity without negative emotion to a situation. So you can just sit there and see it for what it is with no aversion. And the reason we want that is we want to see the situation that is clearly so that we can deal with it in reality to get effective action. So we need to know where we are in order to know how we're going to get where we want to go. For instance, if I said to Olav, I would like to go to Holland, and he said to me, where are you? And I said, I don't know. How can he help me get there? We need to know where we are. The second thing that the monks talk about is generating insight. And when they talk about that, they're saying right understanding. So we need to have a genuine right understanding about something so that we can have an effective response. Jeff Patton's idea is very interesting. The whole idea is eternal quest, building the right thing versus building a thing right. You need insight to know which of those you're going to use. But this third thing has basically turned me into a, a blonde that talks about compassion. Uh, but I'm actually talking about it in terms of compassion as a database of information that we can use to understand whether or not a people's solution will work. That's what I mean. And you all now have to hug. So the thing is, compassion helps us generate effective action when we're dealing with human beings, when we're dealing with people. This is a thing that psychopaths can't do. So it establishes the likelihood of success with a system of people who are interacting with and for people. The fourth thing that I have here is sustainable actions and pace. If you want to, oh, well, politics is never going to end, is it? Really. Reactions to tools is never going to end. People are going to get attached to stuff. People are going to get aversions to things. People are going to be ignorant. So whatever solution we have needs to be sustainable in some form. That's a long slide. So, <laughs> so I'll keep going. Uh, an example of this, equanimity is, I see I eat a lot of junk food, right? It doesn't really give you any action. Oh, great. An insight would be, I understand why and no, I shouldn't eat junk food. Still, not much action. But compassion is different because what it says is, I feel how much this affects my body, my family, and my future. And in that, it instigates action, a desire for action. So the Buddhists talk about this as, that's why compassion, so the Dalai Lama most recently said that compassion is the radicalism of today. Interesting. Consider that we're in a psychopathic business environment. So you can look this up. There's some research by Professor Singer uh, in cognitive neuroscience. Um, and it seems to map directly to Eastern philosophy that I've looked at. She says that empathy can lead to burnout, whereas compassion motivates. For instance, if Olav is apathetic and I empathise with him, I will become apathetic. Whereas compassion... And what do you mean, Catherine? <laughs> oh, you were zoning out, you know, I, I want to help you here. Uh, and compassion is where I look at Olav, oh, Look at, look at that problem. And I think to myself, <laughs> how can I solve this situation? Yeah? And I develop a plan of action. It's a motivated, active sense. So I want to help him get rid of his apathy, why he didn't answer my emails for three weeks about the presentation that I was about to do with him. Yeah, that kind of thing. 
Uh, go back one. Yeah. So here's the interesting thing. Do you remember we talked about we need grit and determination. We need ways to make what we do resilient. Compassion, this lady claims, increases activation in the brain networks associated with affiliation and reward. We actually get a little reward for being compassionate. And that becomes something we can do over and over and over again. See, psychopaths, and you can read Adam McNabb's book. He's written it with a guy from Oxford. They say, you don't need empathy. You don't need compassion. It's a load of crap, right? He says, just ask yourself, what am I here to achieve? And empathy doesn't help you get there. So he trains CEOs. That's what, what Andy does. But here is where psychopathic behaviour fails us. We remember we're in an industry that uh, people interact with people or to make tools for people to interact, right? So it's a little bit different for us. Psychopaths can't access that database of compassion in order to understand what people-orientated solutions or initiatives might be like to experience. You can make up whatever approach you want to make up, but if people aren't going to adopt it, great. It means nothing. They can't use compassion tools to increase the likelihood of success of a people-orientated solution. That's interesting. That was very, very interesting to me. You can talk now, Olaf. Well, thank you very much. I could get to share the stage. Um, so my way of dealing is that while I use a lot of uh, agile tools, in communicating with people, um, if you talk about retrospectives, sprints, that doesn't help me if I want to get to a higher understanding within the organization and help them understand what we're trying to do. So I believe that we should have, or at least what I do is I use options thinking and I use that to explain what we're doing. And by being aware of multiple options, and this is actually what's underlying many of the agile practices that we have, we try to postpone the, the point at where we actually commit to a certain thing, where we have to decide on a certain kind of action. Um, let's just plan for two weeks and then we'll adjust as we get feedback, which is basically just postponing parts of the planning, which is a good thing. But the options way of explaining it helps us to get into a conversation with people who are not used to uh, talking about technology in teams and that kind of thing. So I've worked together with uh, Chris Matz, who's supposed to be my better half. I just found out. Um, According to me. Right. And we, we came up to this, let's call it a model, which is just three lines, 14 words. Options have value, meaning that if you have the option to still do something, that is more valuable than just the thing of doing it. So, for instance, you can now book a flight to visit Cuba. That has a particular value to you, but there might a be a regime change later on. No, and you no longer have that option available to you. So there's value in the fact that you can choose at a later stage. Options expire. At some point, an option isn't there anymore. So you have to be aware at what condition at some point happens, which could be a time, it could be the regime change. That, that option that you wanted to have is no longer there. So you have to be proactive and make sure that the things that you're talking about and that you try to plan, that you do that at the right time. And the last thing is never commit early unless you know why. And that is about um, if you know when a certain point is where there's no reasonable way back, you at least have to know why. It's either because the option expires or if you commit to something now, so you put in a particular kind of architecture, it will allow you more choice later on or it is because otherwise you cannot do that anymore. It would be very costly. So as long as you're aware of things, you can commit to things, but do it consciously. And the other thing is that, as Catherine said, politics is not going away. It's been here for more than 2,000 years. It will be here in 2,000 years. It will still be here. Before I argue with you, um, if you go back one slide, can you apply that in a people sense? Which one? Well, knowing about real options, how does that help you with politics, people interaction politics? Right. 
it help, so real options help me helps me in interacting with people where I can, uh, for instance, a director wants to have a particular choice. So as soon as you present him with a problem, he wants to have a solution. So you propose a solution, okay, let's do that. However, you can use this as a way of saying, as a solution, instead of finding a solution, you can say, let's find out more information, let's keep that option open until we find more information, and we'll f there's, uh, we're going to find the information in this particular way. So instead of providing him with a solution, I provide him with actually multiple solutions with options, and we'll decide at a later time buying us more information, and that will help me get over his resistance if I propose a particular solution. Yes, but what happens if he just he sees you as being indecisive? If he just you know, well, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> so if I, I just just propose if that's uh, if you do the option use to a extreme, then you're postponing everything. So you're trying to not commit to anything. And this is really where the third line is, never commit early unless you know why. If that's a danger with that particular person, and you, at some point you have the experience of that, you commit to certain things, but at least you know why. And at that point, you t I will try to find the things I can commit to that ha still have the most flexibility from my perspective. I'll let you off for now. Thank you. So your thought is? There will always be politics. So uh, politics will be here for the next 2,000 years, and not playing politics is not an option. If you're in an organization, it doesn't matter where you are, you are affected by politics. You are actually playing in that game, and it is a game. But it's a serious game, but it's a social game. And not playing is not a possibility. But I think Catherine has a different opinion. I do. I have a different opinion. In that, in Eastern philosophy, there is one thing that binds everybody, and that is their shared reality. And so you can, ha you can find ways and means to harmonize the situation based on data and the reality. For instance, both sides, say, the agile teams and the executives, have a common goal to make money, right? Eventually. Right. By the end of it. And so that can become the criteria by which you can harmonize the current reality. That is a reality. Right, and how do you achieve that reality? Well, you utilize agile and lean tools. <laughs> you mean you try <laughs> to influence an organization by getting um, towards your goal? Yes, but I would hesitate to use too many options. So there is politics involved, <laughs> however you want to spin it. It's just a way, it's a different view. Oh, we have some questions. Then you'll need options. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. So, if you know that politics is going to be around anyway, and you want to have a chance at influencing what happens in your organization or I within your team, learn the, the way to play the game of power. And power is an ugly word, and we don't like it, but we do like the effect of it. So, as long as we don't do it publicly, we like it as soon as we're in a group and we talk about it, uh, it's evil. So, how do you play it m correctly? Well, one is master your emotions. As soon as you start being emotional, you start becoming irrational, you start being uh, led by your feelings, and you're playing in the cards of the other players. Equanimity. So That's equanimity. So we don't disagree that much. There's part of that, what's part of playing politics correctly resonates very well with Catherine saying. Distance yourself from the present. Look at the, what's happening now and connect that to what you want to achieve in the future and what you've seen in the past. Not from a guilt perspective, but learn from your experience. That's insight. Just saying. Appearance matters. So it, it matters how you do things. So you can protest openly. That will affect the position of the other player in the game. However, if you do that privately, you have a better chance of having success. Compassion. And then there's patience. <laughs> there's waiting. If you want to achieve a goal. So as an agile coach, I would like a uh, company to become successful. And I think that they can do that by using agile methodologies. 
and putting Agile in place. If I want to have that change in one week or six weeks, uh, not going to work. So I need to allow the politics to play its part. I need to influence people. I need to make sure that things will get, people get to their own conclusion that Agile is the best way of doing it. Otherwise, it's my idea and it will be shot off anyway. Grit and determination. And then there's see the circumstances, not good and evil. So see things as they are. If somebody objects to your plan, it's not because that person is evil or has an evil goal. There is something that why he thinks that that plan is not good enough to help this organization get to the next stage. So let's get back to getting alignment on the goals. That's also by influencing the right people. This whole social game, it's a game played with people. So you have to be nice, Catherine. I'm trying, Olev. And be indirect, so not direct Catherine indire uh, directly. You do it. Oh, right. In summary, um, in this ever-changing technology industry, be always aware that people are interacting with people to make solutions and software for people to interact. So although it's a technology that industry that we're working on, it's really about people. Consider that bigger picture when you're suffering from politics, I think. Well, at least this helped myself, and I suppose it helped you, just to sort of see it in this form, that we have psychopathic self-interested behavior, we add to it uh, some introverts, we get high pressure change, we put in some collaborative, interactive, agile and lean, we encase it with a traditional hierarchical power structure and that's what we're suffering from as an industry. And the thing about it is that I would like to look at this with equanimity and compassion and get some insight about what to do about it. This is, these are just ideas, these are just discussions we're having in order to create a solution. So this is the overview of the strategies that we've used uh, the as you see, they overlap, they're using different words, slightly different uh, motivations, but they're trying to get to the same effect. So finally, uh, this is just a, a two different perspectives. This is something that we've experienced over our working career that we've looked into. Uh, we presented it, this to you. We hope that you'll take this with you. I hope that you either violently agree or you <laughs> violently disagree. It's the way that Catherine and I collaborate. <laughs> uh, we do actually care about each other, no worries. Mm. Uh, and look into this. Look into uh, the power of compassion. Look in, there's uh, scientific material about that, that it makes sense. Now, I'm not a big fan of all the hippie stuff that we do with an agile. Not, I don't like all that hugging. <laughs> there, but there is scientific data that actually shows that it's very effective. So look into that. Why have you got this at the end? I tried to trick you in saying that. Develop compassion for power. So no. Well, there is power structure in organizations. So, and it's not just one person or a Oh, hang on. This is because you're a director of sales. I see. We have to have compassion for those in power. And you I have to it. do it in an evil, agile, coach way. Got it. All right. So there, is, um, there are ways of steering an organization. Um, and there's look into the science behind that as well. It will help you become more effective in what you want to do. And with that, we want to thank each other. And you guys, we'd love to get feedback. So use the conference app for that or contact us directly. We're here for the rest of the day. And otherwise, we'll, you can find us on Twitter. Exactly. Let's have a hug. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Please chat to us after. Do we have time for questions? Two minutes. If anybody has any questions, do the Oprah Winfrey thing. Oh. So, c can you switch back to the kind of psychopath evaluation slide? Okay. <laughs> That's going to take us two minutes. Sorry. This one? This one? No, there was a checklist for what makes you psychopath. Oh, it's quite long. That is a summary. It's just five. Here it is. Yeah, kind of, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm kind of, yes, 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 yes. So where does that leave me now? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, 
there are spectrums of that. Um, compassion has equanimity in it, and you can mistake that for being careless or that you don't care. But the fact that you see problems, human problems, and you want to solve them, that's compassionate. Um, these things, this is just something that uh, I think you put up there, <laughs> that you're making me answer for, which I kind of agree with and kind of don't. Right, so this is just a the top five of things that you can recognize easily. So don't worry about yourself. There's seven other factors that you can rate yourself at. Um, so it's really things that you can uh, look for if you see that kind of behavior. That might be triggers for you to think, okay, that person might have a higher number on the psychopath scale. But it's not that you're a psychopath at that point. Yeah, but can I uh, I'm, I'm joking, but on a more conceptual question, so what... So uh, I, I was kind of joking, but on a more conceptual level, what, what do you do when you spot people that rate high like that in in an organization, and you 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 know you you have to kind of start dealing with them or or working around them? I noticed that Catherine wants to answer that one. I do. Um, firstly, you value them, so I'm not saying they're bad people, but you need to know that they don't have access to the compassion database. So you need to set up structures within an organization and tools within an organization that will give you that information. And that person needs to understand that they don't have this ability to see the whether or not a solution will be successful when it's in relation to people. So I think it's not about saying psychopaths are all bad and we don't want them, because they can be fantastic to bring into a very messy political situation where they cut through to the point. But we have to just mitigate against them occasionally, because they can start making decisions which harm people and are in their own self-interest, which is not necessarily in line with what we're trying to do as an, a corporation. I thought I saw some other questions up there. If not, oh yes, oh, oh, oh yeah, oh wait, yeah. Sprint. Sprint. Okay. <laughs> so the final question. No, just uh, an explanation for the list. So I, I've studied that in one level deeper. So, so the psychopaths uh, can be cha in 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 hysterical, histrionic, in narcissistic. And in obsessive compulsive, there is also a, there is a. I have a list on my computer. If you if you <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I I have them from from the statistic manual of the Psychological American Association. This is a very thick book, and there you have the clinical diagnostic criteria. I can show you the book, and this is a mixture between half of them is from narcissistic and superficially charming is hysterical. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, and uh, you uh, you can it better better understand it if you if you uh, study all the personality disorders. These are I, I eleven, <laughs> and and I talked about in my keynote about autistic ones. You have also one of them. So and and the, the others have difficulties to deal with you, and 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 w in, in principle, it's a fine idea to study all the 11 personality disorders from the psychological organization. Brilliant. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, guys. Have fun. We'll get to you later. Mm -hmm.